Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. And um, I'm going to share this screen now. Uh, I'm <laughs> it's always like, oh, my God. Uh, it was there. Oh. Uh, launch meeting. Where is that? Now we did uh, disappeared completely. Oh, oh my God! Uh, it's nothing. To, um, uh, is it okay now? Can you see this light? No. No, 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 no. It's a strange, really strange. Uh, share screen again. Oh, now it goes. It will go now. Okay. Okay, now? Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, well, my uh, interesting lady, Mary Waterley Montagu, um, comes from the past. I think everybody has heard or came across some of her letters and got into uh, her Turkish letters in some point of our lives. Um, well, it's been uh, 260 years that she's, uh, she passed away and she's still at the same time and my interest in women's letters from the past, especially women from Renaissance period and afterwards uh, Lady Mary Waterley Montagu are these women that made a difference in a totally men's world. These women that stood up for their voices and they were not afraid of anything and they left uh, mostly from their time letters. So our access to what they thought or what they lived is almost entirely based in letters. So that's why I came into this and uh, I want to show some of my uh, latest experience and during this year in uh, at the University of York on especially uh, Mary Waterley Montagu. Oh, gosh a bit um oh no uh, okay um in all the um mostly theoretical approaches etc there's always this question and some theories pointing out about an epistolary woman trying to find aspects in these letters that show that these women were seduced, uh, sometimes betrayed, suffering, and they write to lament life, uh, life in general, uh, men and uh, difficulties, etc. Um, so my question is, is this really uh, the vision and the life experience of these women or is it some view of part of these women's that some people uh, make a concept out of that and uh, so to understand this deeply i had to go to the documents to read the whole version of the letters and see if there was other women, uh, other aspects of these women, and if there was such a thing as uh, an epistolary woman, or if it, this was a male creation or a male concept designed even to marginalize women, uh, or perhaps to, um, based in their grounded knowledge, uh, without fully conscious of their gender issues. So they used this and they created this kind of approach to, um, to epistolary women. 
and Lady Mary Waterley Montagu. Um, she does not, um, she cannot occupy this place. Uh, she, what she wrote goes much beyond um, um, in terms of influence, in terms of concepts, in terms of advocating um, into women's power. I'm going to show many of her pictures and this is one of them, uh, a painting from Jonathan Richardson the Younger, which is recognized at his time uh, in Netherlands as one of the main painters and uh, at his time, and he painted Lady Mary Waterley Montagu. Um, we can see here, and if we can uh, deeply pay attention, most of her paintings, they have uh, some kind of orient culture, oriental culture, or a little bit of evidence of her majestic figure and the way that we can see she's a woman that she's there, she's not only uh, looking or together with a man, all her portraits, most of her portraits, they show a whole figure of the body. When in that time, most of the women were sometimes uh, pictured or painted, especially what they call aristocrat women painted just uh, the face. So she cannot um, fit into those, uh, let's say, concepts. And uh, I had to read her voice and uh, uh, some of the these concepts were saying like she was uh, an aristocrat, oh, she's an aristocrat uh, person, etc. And we are going to see that the concept of um, aristocrat, it's somebody who thinks herself over or upon other people. And uh, it's one of the, the concepts. Um, and she's not really like that. And she wanted to be recognized for her poetry. So um, we start to understand that things are much more complex, that sometimes our uh, understanding or what has been written about her. So there's a lot of issues in terms of Turkish, the, her Turkish letters. And we are going to see that at that time, all this geopolitical uh, reference with the Orient or with Middle East is very emphasized. And this brought a very high importance to her letters and to everything that she portrayed about uh, Middle East. Uh, and I, the more I read about her, I started having my second thoughts. They say in one page like, oh, Lady Mary devoted, she went back to England and devoted her life to upbringing her family. Actually, this is not correct. She states she only returned to England after Mr. Waterley passed away and after living many years in France and Italy, so, uh, and she wrote to her life, to her daughter and son all her lifetime and so on. So, and they also say that she introduced, uh, advocated for vaccine. Why never, she's, she's a vaccine pioneer. So we don't find vaccine pioneer on her. And we find many times Blake and many other things showing that there were other men that uh, discovered inoculation, which is also not true. So um, she advocates for gender equality and equal education uh, all the time toward in her letters. 
I'm going uh, to show a little bit. So this Orientalism and everything that she portrayed was very important at her time. And, but not only that, because she says, I look upon the Turkish women as the only free people in the empire. So she learned from those women and she exchanged much knowledge in wherever place that she went to. So we are going to see a little bit of this in her letters as well. Uh, thus you see, dear sister, the manners of mankind do not differ so widely as our voyage writers would make us believe. So at the same time, uh, she sees differences and she sees some cultural similarities. And she's all of the time uh, thinking and um, establishing relations between this cultural diversity, which she lived fully. Um, the more that I read her, I started thinking that she's like an avant-garde, which is in French, a person that is experimental, radical, and unorthodox. She's extremely unorthodox, and we are going to see this in respect to art, culture, and society. Basically, somebody who innovates and suffers unaccepted, unacceptability because she's innovating. She's crossing boundaries and she's a change maker. And we are going to see that in her letters. So this is another painting, again, with her full boost and her a little bit of smile and her eyes. We can see that they don't paint a submission in this kind of paintings, neither any other things. And she's always carrying some things in other pictures as well. Sometimes a book, sometimes something from Orient. Sometimes her hair is also styled in the same way. So when they say, oh, aristocrat as um, somebody that is best, somebody who's um, best towards other people. She's not like that. She signs her letters like all her letters, your most humble, humblest servant, all her letters to anybody. She says, I'm, I'm learning, I'm your servant. A vaccine def defender, not only that, because she, she actually asked it, uh, she tested vaccine in her children. So she suffered opposition many times. They said they were, she was crazy. She did something upon her children and afterwards, but she said, no, I, she had um, herself suffered from chickenpox and she saw her best friends dying from it. And she said, look, I don't want this for my children. You are going to do this that I had seen in Turkey. And they do that. And it was inoculation. And because of all that, she was extremely criticized from Pope Alexander Pope, because of her their quarrels in writings, to the College of uh, doctors that also criticize her for asking them to inoculate her children. And this is another, oh no, uh, no hang on. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, that's another painting, again, with herself, her boost, her looking up and never looking down, which is very peculiar for women at her time. Uh, from her entire letter collection, which 
the most complete that I found collection is this from the Oxford University Press. I'm going to show you today the first volume, which is um, the letters I'm going to show the period from 1702 to 1719. And in this volume, she writes, she corresponds to these people. And most of her the letters are to her husband. At her time, we didn't have any divorce. Everything was very different. But she was, even though she left him for a while, for quite a while, um, she continued corresponding with him all her life. So he is the person that received the majority of her letters. We have from Anne Wardley, which is a Lady Monotou, uh, 11 letters, and to Alexander Pope, Pope in this collection, four letters. There are some other letters, and especially in this period of her life, she wrote mostly to him, and two important friends. So she she was like building a career in social life and some of her friends that she had left in England. Then the volume two of this Oxford collection, we have mostly again letters to Wortley, then to Lady Mar, which became her best friend, to her daughter was Lady Boot, who is a uh, grown up, and to Francesco Algarotti, which is uh, her lover, let's say her lover, because she, uh, she went after him and they exchanged letter and they had agreed to meet and live together, but then it didn't work out. And um, um, I didn't, just to pinpoint this now, I didn't bring this, uh, the letters from Francesco Algarotti because they are in volume two, but I'm doing that and they are very, very um, contemporary, let's say, ways of women and men's relationship in a way that she does not expand she she gets angry with him and he starts giving excuse not to meet her and she says look i'm not going to be waiting here for you uh thank you very much don't don't uh don't keep me waiting uh so there are many things that are very very contemporary in their exchange letters and then in the third, because this is divided by years, so at the third part of her life, she writes to her children most of the times, very little to Mr. Wortley, and a little bit of mis miscellaneous letters because she needed favor, uh, she wanted to leave some things to somebody, etc. So she has this kind of letters. So. Here, I, I do think there is, in terms of measure, an idea of why she's writing and to whom. Who is important in her life? Not in what I want to research, but in her life. And, and this, this is what I'm following. I'm not following what I want, but her perspective. And her perspective is this in terms of quantity of letters. I used a qualitative and quantitative analysis um, and I would uh, and a new approach to letters saying letters as continents, letters as really not only discursive analysis but as medias that created uh, new uh, directions, new um, possibilities, new inventions, because this is all in her letters. Um, 
and so on. This is another of her paintings, again, with this one with her son, and very uh, majestically uh, dressed and in full body, as we can see again. So, I'll show you some letters and then uh, some of the quantitative analysis of these three, which are Anne, uh, Worderly, and Pope. And this is um, a letter um, to Anne, and her with Lady Morton, they exchange usually uh, um, um, a little bit of gossip and a little bit of um, a thinking uh, and how are you feeling and uh, oh please don't forget me so friendship mostly and uh, uh, personal the personal self like oh I'm not feeling well I think I shall run mad with what hurt can people write when they believe their letters will never be received. So she was really angry that she didn't receive her letter. Um, and um, also a way of expressing the self. So we again um, see like, I believe you will expect this letter to be dated from the other world. Um, so uh, they engage into this kind of exchange. When I do the quantitative textual analysis, I come with this visual, which I think is very uh, creative and interesting way with all Anne's letters. So I come with these mostly density words, I am, I have to be which is also her expression. He, she's fully, fully expressing herself in the letters. So you, Lady Anne, you think dear, so the word dear, very common, there's an affection, you know, tell. So it's these kind of words that are mostly exchanged between them. We are running out of time. <laughs> I'm going to speed up a bit. Um, <coughs> Mr. Waterley, her uh, husband, actually official husband, um, Friday night. I think this is very interesting because I picture this uh, woman on a Friday night, lonely and writing to him. So, uh, I tremble for what we are doing. Are you sure we will love me forever? Shall we never repent it? I fear and I hope. Um, so there's a lot, lot of love and affection, even though they are sometimes apart and even though they have kind of separate life. Uh, in this letter, which I'm fond of, I promise it all that I wish. Um, and then let me just, um, I don't know. Um, my resolution is take me, is taken, love me. And this is to Edward Wortley Montagu. Um, I think thoughts for Friday night. She was like, will you love me forever? And so on, <laughs> this kind of thing in a time where there was no, uh, well, no message. So, will you love me? Why are we doing this, etc. So, this kind of thing. Another one to him, one year afterwards. This now candlelight, I just received your letter. Uh, but I need no excuse but your example for making it a shorter one. And there was, a, uh, they actually uh, keep asking each other letters and, and so on. Uh, the, 
your little boy, especially across this, your little boy is very well. Uh, the man is obstinate in having the letter this night. And um, I will not delay sending to you for fear there should be business. Uh, so she just sends, this is just a note. And this is a photograph of Sir Edward Wortley Montagu, who is, was a very important and diplomat, actually, with England and the Turkish Empire at that time, especially for economical purpose, which continues 260 years afterwards. So I, I like especially your boy is very well. And this is uh, four years afterwards. He becomes ill and she's very worried about him. I'm extremely concerned about at your illness and um, uh, I beg of you with the greatest earnestness, uh, take care of your health first. So this kind of thing that we also see uh, nowadays, take care of your health and uh, um, and also see she comments a little bit about money. I do pray, take care of your health. So again, a kind of affectionate letter in term, in many other terms that only not uh, what we expect. And I see more than a marriage, a friendship between them all through their lifetime. When I put this into quantitative textual analysis, I come to this. So it's again the self, you, think you know uh, and some similar words to the same as N, I am, I have, I should, I know, I could. But here there's a little bit, I tend to assume a little bit more of regret. I should, I could, but she doesn't follow the expectations, not his not anyone's. With Mr. Pope, there's a big quarrel because actually um, many issues um, into them, but they were friends and she sent all her poems and all the translations to him. And he published some using her stuff, which would be nowadays counted at into cop, uh, copyright uh, rights. But at her time, there was this big thing and they quarreled and they suspect he liked her and she did, didn't correspond. And he was really angry and he started re heavily criticizing her. So she wrote to Pope some letters, but at volume two and volume three, there's no letters to Pope. He died to her. He doesn't, she doesn't care anymore, I think. Uh, but at the volume one, at the beginning of all everything, uh, she, they are friends. She's telling him all her adventures. She tells him all uh, her uh, trips and everything. So she says here, uh, how my adventures will conclude, I leave entirely to Providence, if comically you shall hear of them. Uh, if I leave, I will answer your letter. So, all this kind of thing. Another letter, this is an immense letter to him, explaining all the fights between the Turkish, the German and some other regions and she wrote all about that and she explains uh, even about war. I could not look without horror. Uh, that makes murder not only necessary, but meritorious. Uh, this is irrational. So she she's already saying that war is irrational and uh, etc. 
and that Arabian, they had another style different in terms of poetry and she was learning with them. Uh, another one, uh, he asked her to write an epitaph uh, to some people and she does and sends to him. So this proves that they were very close together and he used it, not to say abused of this friendship. And what happens is, uh, this is also the picture of the qualitative, quantitative analysis. One saying great, they were great friends, I think. Basa is the word for Turk Turkish uh, people at the time. Uh, time here make you, and then these are the words of in the I am I have the same that are the most dense words. And here we don't have so much that sensibility from the previous letters. And uh, he accused her, he was, he continued in England and she was traveling. So more or less, um, there is this uh, Picus, uh, very unique painting called Pape Makes Love to Lady Mary and she despised him. And this is a real painting uh, from this artist. And actually she uses dark humor, irony, ambiguity, sarcasm, etc. Everything she could with the pen to make justice. Let's say like that. The pen is mightier than the sword. Uh, he called her Sappho. Uh, so she's been... Um, and Sappho, this is Sappho. Sappho was uh, um, a Greek poet uh, who was, uh, at her time, was um, free. And, uh, but calling someone Sappho was not a good thing. Um, so, uh, we understand that um, what we do when women had the authorships and the rights to publish something. Uh, why, why was he calling her Sappho uh, and etc. So there's a lot of things in terms of women's intellectual property that has been robbed in history, let's say like that. Um, all in all, we have, uh, I apply digital humanities to try to extract uh, the data, but that's not enough. I believe that just digital humanities doesn't make me read her words. I need to read her words to understand that. So the importance of the author's voice. Another thing that we can use nowadays is this mapping to build the continent of letter. And that's what I'm doing right now to try to understand this deeply. The fourth issue is empathy in uh, epistolary studies and other studies because I think there's a lot of discussions in terms of content and not about emotions and what changed people and what makes Lady Mary so important I think is talking freely about emotions about everything and the importance of discovering I knew I tried to put everything that people had read about her aside and read and went into reading her without any preconception and i think that made all the difference if i'm going to say something now uh, i might go into a podcast or some kind of vi more visibility and more interactions um, into her because she is all of that and much more. The more I read, the more I discover. 
this is another painting again full body uh, because she's a person as a whole she's not just a part she's a whole uh, uh, woman in her overall and she's very unique so I think that makes her uh, stand beyond her time 260 years afterward and I was like Wow, I'm glad that you existed. Her signature is Lady, sometimes, Mary Wardley Montagu. I've been argued in academy that she was Lady Mary. I said, no, Lady Mary is the mother of Christ. Forget it. She signed as Lady Mary Wardley Montagu. She has a full name. She's not uh, Lady Mary. And this is a letter, her signature, and again, her signature in all the letters. This one she write, she was writing, your humble servant, but then she corrected, your very humble servant. If she needed a favor, she would say like, your very humble servant, or sometimes just your servant. And because I do believe she was putting all her uh, way and her living and herself out there in these letters. And that's it. Thank you so much. I spoke too much and I hope I didn't make it too fast. And I'm very open to questions and anything uh, you might have in terms of um, sharing.